ready for takeoff. All right, let's go ahead and uh, kick things off. Folks uh, straggling, that's totally fine. Uh, What's going on, folks? Uh, my name is Kevin Winery, and I'm uh, the head of developer experience at a company called uh, Retool. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, not the mullets that you might think of uh, when you read the title initially, um, but actually a, a phenomenon that happens a lot in software development uh, where you have uh, kind of two different uh, very separate uh, types of applications that you're responsible for maintaining as a developer. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know, the relationship between uh, kind of the, uh, the, the customer facing, the front of the, the, front of the house uh, type of software applications that we build, um, and also these uh, sort of back office applications that uh, might be a little different. They might serve a smaller audience, but are kind of no less impactful. So uh, we'll take a look at kind of the difference between those types of applications. Applications, um, and then I'd like to show you uh, one approach to uh, kind of building out uh, the back office side of things uh, using the uh, platform ritual that uh, I've recently joined to, uh, to help build out. Um, if you have any questions uh, along the way, um, I'll try to save some time at the end. Uh, we can drill down into any areas that might be interesting to folks, um, as I think we do have a little bit of time um, in between the sessions. So I wanted to uh, start off by saying I are sort of explaining a situation that I'm betting that many of you in the room have encountered at some point in your software development career. Um, if you have as much uh, gray hair as I do, uh, chances are good that uh, you know, maybe dozens of times over the course of your career, uh, you've, had, you've been in a situation where you've worked on one application that is like the main application. It's the, the customer-facing application, uh, the consumer-facing experience that you build out uh, for the customers of your software company. It's sort of the glossy uh, uh, application that uh, what is what most people think of when they think of your company. Um, in addition to that application, there's also the back office, the, you know, the administrative interface, the dashboards, like the software that you build that runs behind the scenes and helps your business actually operate uh, either your software in production or certain like key aspects of your, of your business. Uh, and there's kind of a few like uh, properties that distinguish these two types of software. So uh, for the main application, it's typically the thing that your users uh, interact with on a daily basis. Uh, and in that application, uh, UI polish and differentiated UX are actually pretty important. They, uh, they differentiate your product from others in the marketplace. Um, so having a user experience that is unique to that application is actually pretty important. Uh, they're also, uh, those types of applications are also built for a broad uh, audience with diverse needs. So you might have uh, you know, one type of user with a very different usage pattern, um, and then that same user has to be accommodated in the same platform uh, by uh, another type of user with very different needs. So uh, you tend to be building for a very broad audience. Uh, you're also optimizing for many users that are executing small uh, tasks. So uh, if you're building uh, Twitter, you are optimizing for lots of people um, uh, sending tweets. Uh, and in general, you have to assume that most of the users of your application should have like pretty restricted access to whatever data uh, your application is using. Um, and you can kind of compare this to what's happening with like your back office software, which is um, it's typically something that's internal facing that maybe your partners or your fellow employees use. Uh, it's uh, more uh, important that this software is like performant and utilitarian versus having like a super differentiated UX. A lot of the times when you're building that uh, back office software, uh, you tend to reach for you know material UI or bootstrap or whatever like the off the shelf like CSS framework du jour is uh, because like that side of the application just isn't that important. Uh, it's not as important uh, as the, like, as a contributor to the success of the app. Uh, you're tending to build for a small audience with a very specific set of needs. Uh, sometimes that audience is as small as like the 10 people on your support team that need to interact with a particular type of data um, in your infrastructure somewhere. Uh, you're also kind of optimizing for a relatively small number of users that have, uh, you know, fairly uh, complex needs. Like sometimes they will have to be able to kick off 
hours long data export uh, jobs, which is not typically a thing that you'll see like in your uh, consumer facing application. Uh, they also uh, generally have privileged data access. So uh, you, know, you usually protect those applications with some kind of uh, like corporate SSO. Uh, you are pretty interested in maybe auditing the steps that are happening or like the actions that people are, people are taking in that back office software uh, because it matters for regulatory concerns or, uh, or what have you. So uh, the sort of requirements for these two types of applications uh, end up being pretty different. Uh, but um, at least a lot of uh, companies I've worked at over the years, um, if you're in a situation where you have both the main app and uh, the back office app, uh, somebody usually loses in terms of prioritization, and it's almost always uh, the back office uh, applications or those internal tools. Um, largely because like the main app is probably what's like the revenue driver for your company. It's the, it's the thing that is customer facing. Uh, it's built uh, for a larger audience, so work on like the main app actually impacts a lot more people um, than the back office software. Um, and like to developers, like sometimes uh, that is the more exciting piece of software to work on, like building a differentiated UX, uh, shipping software that impacts uh, customers outside the company. Uh, sometimes can be sometimes can be a more attractive prospect than building that critical internal tool uh, that uh, everybody at the company uses every day. Um, and then sort of on the flip side, uh, the reasons why the back office side sometimes gets underinvested in is because rather than being tied to revenue, internal tools usually save time. It's about like making your team more efficient and uh, creating operational excellence, uh, which has massive impact on the bottom line, but it's harder to kind of directly trace that work back to something that uh, helps your business. Uh, it's also because of the impact is smaller. It impacts a smaller number of people. Uh, it can sometimes be hard to like justify an investment in creating like really great internal tooling. Uh, and then uh, one thing for me as a front end developer, um, I actually uh, you know know and am pretty sold on the utility of having internal tools. Uh, but it's kind of boring to like build the same uh, React UI or like form-based UI over and over and over again. Um, and that's actually you know, part of why I'm uh, at the company I'm at now is because uh, I'm kind of tired of doing that. I've done it many dozens of times and uh, you know, I think there should be a better way of handling that. And uh, one of the big ones for uh, that sort of disincentive, disincentivize uh, folks from working on internal tools is the maintenance burden of yet another application. Now, you might actually think like, oh, it's, it's just a CRUD application. Uh, it's just a small web application that I can just throw together and deploy. Um, unfortunately, there's really no such thing as a small web application. Um, before I uh, joined Retool, I spent uh, 10 years at a company called Twilio. And uh, one of the big like internal engineering philosophies uh, that we have was uh, no free puppies, which means you don't like bring a new piece of technology into the technology ecosystem, like spin up a Go application because you think Go is cool and you wanted to try to build something with it. Uh, you have to consider like what the maintenance and sort of long-term uh, scalability and maintainability of that application is. Uh, and internal tools are just one more uh, potential surface area where you create you know, another Node.js application or Rails application where you have uh, the dependencies get out of date and the next time somebody has to touch it, they spend you know, days trying to update a dependency that has, a, has some kind of critical security vulnerability. So lots of reasons why uh, you might want to go around uh, building these internal tools. But uh, so w because of that like sort of lack of investment, uh, oftentimes there's these like kludgy workarounds that will emerge uh, in the place of like software driven uh, internal tools. So um, there's the classic like one-off admin script. Uh, you know, the picture here is the laptop that is actually a server that is running some kind of like long running ETL task um, that uh, is shockingly common, uh, actually. You would, you would be surprised at how many like very large companies uh, are doing stuff like this where like critical business workflows are happening on just a random laptop. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, you know, you as a developer, I'm sure like a, a decent chunk of folks in the room uh, have been like tapped on the shoulder by a business person to say like, hey, can you run this query for me real quick and like dump this data out to a CSV or what have you? Um, and it's really annoying because you have to, you know, do kind of a one-off administrative task to get that person the data that they need. So. Uh, these are things that happen. We have uh, you know, potentially business users trying to solve their own problems. 
uh, through sort of spreadsheet-driven uh, janky workflows that uh, you know, require human processes at every step of the way. Uh, or they find some software as a service that does like a, a good chunk of what they want to do, but not quite everything. Uh, and uh, they kind of have to make some compromises based on uh, what happens to be available in a particular piece of SaaS. Uh, and in these cases, it's almost always true that some custom-built software would uh, work better. It would actually enable teams to work a little more efficiently, a little bit closer to the actual uh, flow of the work that they want to accomplish. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can actually build software that uh, uh, solves some of these problems, um, and because it's software, uh, improves the data integrity of uh, you know, the information that's going into and coming out of the system, and removes that capacity for human error uh, that can be introduced otherwise. Uh, generally, uh, you, know, you should be thinking about, like, especially in these internal tool use cases, that uh, software, uh, custom-built software specifically, can work better to serve some of these needs than these like, one-off admin scripts or uh, manual workflows. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to show real quick um, in the uh, back, sort of back half of the talk here is kind of how you can go about building the back office uh, side of an application um, using some of the tools available in the uh, Retool platform. So uh, Retool is a, uh, a platform for developers that's sort of purpose built for creating these internal tools that uh, drive a lot of businesses. Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, we have, one of our customers is uh, Stripe, an API provider that's up on the screen here, and they have an internal application that their like customer support people use every day to like process chargebacks and uh, refunds and those types of things. Um, and there's, you know, uh, lots of businesses who create these custom interfaces uh, that are used uh, heavily every single day. Uh, and uh, those use cases are what Retool was built to, uh, built to uh, support. So uh, in your back office software, you typically are going to be accessing all of the same uh, data sources, APIs, uh, that your uh, sort of main production application uses, um, but in, in a slightly different way. You might have privileged access to those uh, interfaces or those resources uh, versus some of your um, internal services. Um, and you probably want to have that layer of uh, corporate SSO and uh, audit logging on top of some of those privileged operations. Um, and all of that is sort of uh, part of the, of the platform um, that uh, I'm just going to show you uh, how, to, how to work with real quick. Um, so in this particular uh, example, uh, we're going to show how you can build an application that uh, talks to like your application uh, layers APIs, um, and also directly to some of the data sources that are used by the application. In this case, it's going to be a Postgres uh, database. So uh, let's uh, stop talking and actually uh, see how that works. So uh, I'm going to head over here to the browser. And uh, I'm on uh, retool.com. Uh, so I'm going to show you how like, sort of the hosted version of Retool works. But uh, Retool also can be uh, deployed inside like, your VPC with uh, you know, a, set, a set of Docker containers um, if you need your internal tools to have access to sort of privileged data that's behind a firewall. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one mode of interacting with Retool, but not the only one. And uh, most uh, internal applications start with um, access to various resources, the internal databases and APIs, uh, like, all the, like all the services that might exist in your business that drive like various parts of the stack, um, you'll tend to expose those as resources. So in this, ca in this case, uh, I'm going to actually be building an administrative interface uh, for one of the most important enterprise applications that any of us has ever worked on, uh, which is the Ruby on Rails guides uh, built-in blog with uh, posts and comments and those types of things. So uh, I'm going to kind of demonstrate how you can do CRUD operations uh, kind of using uh, the logic that you already built in the Rails application, um, and also a pretty common use case for internal tools too, which is some kind of human-in-the-loop uh, workflow where there's like an approval chain that needs to happen. So uh, the one light modification uh, that I have made to uh, this app is that you know, when you make a comment um, on the blog for the first time, um, it actually uh, can only be created in a private mode and has to be approved uh, before it actually shows up um, on the page. So uh, we'll kind of uh, build out some tooling that will allow like, our back office staff uh, to both create content and also to like, moderate uh, these comments um, as they're coming in. Um, and hopefully that'll give you a sense of just sort of how the, how the technology works. 
So in the uh, resources configuration, as I said, we have uh, our Postgres database set up. Uh, this site is actually uh, built and deployed on uh, Render, which I found to be a nice uh, replacement for like the free Heroku Dino. Um, pour one out for the free Heroku Dino. Um, so if you uh, want uh, you know, an environment to play around with uh, for your Rails apps, uh, definitely do recommend it. It was pretty easy to get set up. Um, so this is the uh, Postgres database associated with uh, my render account. And then I also have configured the, uh, the blog API. And I have API in quotes here uh, because I didn't really go through and do the entire API. Um, I just removed CSERF protection from all the Rails routes um, so that I could just hit them with arbitrary uh, HTTP, HTTP requests. So uh, it doesn't even return JSON. So, uh, but I, I do want to use the API to like, be able to post new blog, uh, to create new blog posts and stuff like that. So, uh, we have a couple of resources, and then on top of those resources, we're going to start creating uh, applications. Um, so Retool provides a uh, visual uh, IDE for building out uh, these types of uh, you know, common applications that are mostly like forms, buttons, uh, those, those types of things. So I'm going to come in here and uh, create a new application, and we'll just call it uh, Blog Admin. And I'll... Uh, just double check. I know it's a little bit small, for which I apologize. So I'll try to blow it up uh, just a little bit. Um, but um, on the canvas here, uh, there's a few things that are created for you by default, like this, uh, I, like this uh, ta data table, which um, I'm actually just going to delete because I don't need that. Uh, and I, one of the uh, sort of core building blocks of a retool application is a query, uh, which is either a chunk of logic that's going to like hit an API and bring some kind of data back, or a literal SQL query, uh, which you can write to like uh, pull data out of the uh, databases that you might be working with. Uh, so for uh, there is a query that's in here by uh, by default, and I'm going to start by um, you know in my application I know I'm going to want to do some CRUD on. Uh, a couple of uh, resources. So in the default, like Rails uh, blog application, uh, the primary models are the articles and the comments. So I'm going to write some queries that will actually help me get that data back uh, so I can start using it in my application. So uh, for starters, um, I'm going to select the uh, data source that I need, uh, which is the uh, Postgres uh, database associated with my Rails blog. Um, and then I can write a SQL statement. So I can say a select star from uh, articles. Um, and then I'm going to order by um, updated, whoops, updated at, uh, because uh, I'm going to want to get sort of in uh, reverse chronological order all of the blog posts um, that are in my, uh, in my database. So if I can save that query, and if I hit this like preview button, it'll actually uh, execute the query and kind of give me a sense of what the uh, data is that's coming back. Um, so hopefully that'll work, though. It's going a little longer than it often does. Conference Wi-Fi for you, I guess. Um, but here, let me uh, just refresh to make sure that I am still connected to the network. A network error when attempting to fetch resource, it says. So that does make some sense. Um, try to give it one more try here. I'm going to kill my Wi-Fi and bring it back. Um, probably a cautionary tale uh, where you can actually do local development of Retool as well and not use like the cloud-based version of it. You can uh, download the Docker containers that run like sort of the on-premise Retool. Um, and so you can run Retool on localhost and do your development uh, there as well. But uh, let's bring that back and refresh and see if that helps us at all uh, get back into a functional state for blog admin here. OK. So uh, there we go. Um, let's grab the resource that we need. It looks like it's maybe also not getting my list of resources either, which is uh, less than ideal. Yeah, it looks like perhaps I'm still having uh, network problems here. 
So I, there are my resources, so that's good to see. Let's try to go uh, one more time out here and edit the app. Okay, so there's the resource. It looks like it's coming back, uh, which is great. And if I, I run the query, hopefully um, it will actually give me the results back in a reasonable time frame. This is a bummer because it does have to connect to the Postgres that is uh, running for the blog right now, which it looks like I am also struggling to see. So we're gonna uh, debug it live. I'm gonna actually uh, use my personal hotspot on my phone as an emergency backup. So this is going great, um, just uh, for those of you keeping score at home. Um, I can also try just using like the, the Hilton uh, Wi-Fi too. Let's try that first. What's up? Oh, did it, uh, did it come up? Yeah, it might be the thing that needs to happen. Does often require that. All right, but here, there's my phone. Let's see if that helps at all. Looks like not about it. I can also try to quit Firefox. Occasionally that will help too if I'm changing networks. Okay, so that's positive. Okay, blog admin. Sure, and there we go, okay. So with internet, this works a lot better. Uh, and we can uh, see some, uh, just the uh, blog post from the standard Rails uh, blog application uh, showing up here. So um, I have this data that I can uh, start to work with. Uh, and hopefully uh, my phone I also notice is conveniently at 10% battery. So this is gonna put a lot of pressure on the seven minutes remaining in the presentation, but hopefully it'll be just enough uh, to keep us going. Um, so I have the data source here, um, and uh, I know that like in my blog, uh, I'm gonna want to show uh, the blog post uh, data as it comes back, because uh, that is the sort of read of the CRUD application. Um, so I'll start like kind of assembling interface um, on the canvas uh, using some of these like built-in components. Um, so on the right here, there's sort of a, a palette of built-in controls that you can use to start assembling your application. And uh, this text uh, field can be configured uh, with markdown. Um, so I can just uh, you know, set up uh, an H2 tag that says uh, you know, list articles. And I, to actually display the contents of the blog post, I'm gonna use a component called a list view. And if you've done any development uh, you know, with rich clients before, um, this is like the repeater element or like the iterative loop that you would do in a React application to render out HTML elements uh, one after the other. Uh, so I'm gonna start by like uh, giving this component a, a, a number of rows, which is like how many rows that it should expect to render. Uh, and when I specify dynamic values, like anywhere in the configuration for a component and retool, um, I use these double curly braces. Uh, so I can sort of template in um, dynamic values into the text content anywhere. Um, so in this case, I'm going to uh, use a, what's called a query one dot data. And um, you know, the autocomplete uh, shows me as I go along, like this is you know, the contents of that uh, query. And I, I can reference uh, the first 
Uh, like the, the, this object actually sort of represents a SQL query result set. So uh, this JavaScript object contains keys for each of the fields that are brought back by the query. Um, so one of those uh, fields is the ID, and the length of that ID is going to be uh, about six, about six individual uh, rows. And then within this repeating component, um, I can put in uh, components that will be rendered for each item in my data set. Um, so, whoops, I just missed my drop target there. So, um, as I start to uh, drag this together, I can see these six items being rendered. Um, but instead of this uh, uh, sort of static message, um, I want to show uh, maybe the title of each individual blog post. So, I'm going to say uh, query one uh, dot data, uh, and then I'm going to look for the title of each one. And then um, within this repeater component, I kind of have the access to this um, I variable, which will let me reference like the current, uh, current uh, thing in the array that I'm uh, dealing with. Um, so I can start to render out uh, the title there. And uh, I, can, I can also grab the contents of the uh, blog post. So I'm going to grab, um, just copy that. And here, instead of rendering out the title, I'm going to render out uh, the body of the uh, blog post. Um, so you can see the content uh, starting to pop in there. Uh, so you know, now, now we're starting to see like the, at least the read part of the uh, CRUD application. Um, the other bit uh, that, you know, since we, uh, I want to try to show other uh, bits of the platform here before I have to uh, let you go. So what I'm going to do is create um, a, uh, a form to like start uh, to actually create some new blog posts and start adding some uh, content into the blog. So uh, the, probably the quickest way I can do that is, you know, I'll uh, drag in some uh, text inputs. So uh, here's a text input that I can use, and we'll just kind of create a form to create a new blog post, like right next to this content. Um, and I can uh, specify a label, so we have like a title. And then uh, we also have a uh, status. So if you've gone through the uh, Rails uh, tutorial recently, um, you'll remember like each of the blog posts also has um, a status, which can be like public, uh, private, or archived. Um, so I'm going to create a dropdown uh, for you know each of those options. We got public, private, and uh, archived. And I can set the label to status and also the default value to uh, public. So um, couple, in a couple seconds here, just uh, like whipping together a few form elements that uh, I can use to create a new blog post. And then uh, the, for the content itself, like it might be nice actually to have a rich text editor. So with the blog posts, I can actually uh, you know, have HTML formatted uh, text so I can do uh, bolded content, uh, stuff like that. Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, pop in a rich text element here and uh, you know, I can use this to actually put in the body of the blog post. And then finally, um, you know, I'm going to need a button to actually save this. So I'll pull it down. Uh, I'll just put it out here. It's a little non-standard, but that's OK. And uh, this button, when clicked, uh, will like, save my new blog post. All right. So uh, yeah, just really quickly, I, you know, I'm putting together an interface that'll let me start to uh, create content uh, for the blog. Um, the uh, bits to note here uh, are like we uh, can actually uh, you know, directly uh, add the blog post to the Postgres database using a SQL statement like we saw before. Um, but that's not typically something you want to do. You don't want to sort of YOLO SQL statements uh, to like create data uh, if you can avoid it um, unless uh, you know, you're using a stored procedure, which has some like validation logic baked in or something like that. Uh, uh, a lot of times what you'll want to do is go through the same API that you use for uh, the models, like in your Rails app specifically, um, because you tend to have like your validation and other logic that exists in code uh, that you wouldn't have access to if you just did a SQL statement directly against the database. So what I'm going to do is create another uh, query here. But in this case, it's going to be actually like a REST API request. Uh, to create um, a new resource on the server. So 
instead of the Postgres uh, API, um, I'm going to select this pre-configured uh, API endpoint that I have in my uh, resources tab, which I showed you earlier. And uh, the benefit of kind of pre-configuring an API endpoint like that is you can uh, set like the base URL here, and you can also configure authentication. So the default Rails demo uses HTTP basic auth uh, to protect uh, certain endpoints. Uh, so I actually already have my like HTTP basic auth header configured for this resource, so I can use that across all of the resource or all of the requests that I'm making in the application. So in this case, um, I'm going to be making a post request uh, to the articles uh, endpoint. And then I can include all the, uh, you know, any URL parameters that I would need, um, any headers that I would need. Um, but I also uh, will be passing in the form data, uh, which um, formatted in the right way for uh, creating a Rails model would be like article dot, or, you know, subscript title. Um, and this is just kind of the Rails naming convention for uh, these fields. And then um, I would want to uh, you know, pass in uh, the data from each of those uh, components that I uh, added to the UI earlier. So um, I had a text input, a select, and then a rich text editor. So uh, for the title, um, I can reference, uh, I think it was uh, text input one dot value. And then I can also have uh, my uh, body, uh, which is going to be uh, that rich text editor one uh, dot value. And then finally, uh, I have the status, which is in that uh, select that I added to the UI before as well. So uh, when I do that, um, I'll, I can submit whatever is currently in that form, uh, send it to my Rails API, where like the validation logic that's configured in the active record models will be executed before the model is saved. Um, and then, you know, on success, um, I can handle the success in some way. So like I can rerun the query to show the complete list of blog posts, uh, which is what I'll do uh, right now. Uh, and then on failure, I can also configure JavaScript code that's gonna uh, be executed if I get, you know, a 400 or 500 level error uh, back from the API. So let's go ahead and save that. And then uh, for this button, uh, we can wire up an event handler here uh, to, you know, on a, when, when the button is clicked, it's going to fire off this, uh, this query that I just created. Um, so if I enter a title, you know, some new content, and uh, some kind of text. So this is exciting. We'll see if this works before I let you go to the next session here. Whoops. Just uh, add it to be something, you know, some bold text or something like that. And if I hit save, um, I did get a 500 back, so that is a bummer. I was hoping I was going to be able to stick the landing a little bit here uh, by saving the data. But let's let's see if it's something that I can uh, quickly. Uh... Oh, which one? Yes. Atrical, yeah, that's not a thing. Yep, there we go. So here we go. Let's save that. Now let's try it again. And it looks like it did uh, go through there and we have you know the new blog post content uh, coming up there. So yeah, I'll, I'll, take the pity, I'll take the pity clap, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, internet notwithstanding, uh, today we learned an important lesson about making sure that your hotspot is ready uh, as a backup. But uh, the idea is that, you know, with uh, in just a few minutes, like we implemented at least two letters of the CRUD operations um, against my uh, data store. Um, but what you didn't see is that, you know, every retail application um, can be set up to work with like your company's SSO. So you can have Okta set up to, you know, authenticate users of your uh, of your applications. Um, there's sort of built-in audit logging, so you can see like which users executed which queries, and you can sort of secure queries to be only executable by certain people in your business. Uh, we also didn't get to see our workflow uh, editor, which is like a, a way to create cron tasks in JavaScript. So um, instead of having the uh, laptop open, you can actually run your background tasks in Retool as well. 
Um, so definitely a lot of fun stuff to dig into. Um, I'm also going to be hanging out a little bit um, after the session here and uh, at a table in the uh, exhibit hall if you have any questions about uh, Retool, um, make sure to stop by. And also, uh, I have three Lego sets that I don't want to bring home. Um, so if you just like sign up for a Retool account and build something quickly, uh, you have a chance to take home one of those very fun uh, Lego sets. So make sure you stick, uh, stick around and check that out. Um, but thank you very much. I appreciate the patience and I, would, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.